hitro in lepo pozdravljeni na konferenci Brez pogojni mir, ki bo poskušala intervenirati v to polje zapiranja debate o svetu danes in zlasti skozi perspektivo vprašanja miru. Zdaj, ker imamo seveda tudi nekaj gostov, iz tujine bom cel dogodek potekal v angliščini, če ima kdo s tem, oziroma če bom jo kdo zaradi tega težave se obrnite na najbližjega soseda, mislim, da je taka ekipa, da bomo lahko in z veseljem pomagali. So, dear colleagues, speakers and participants, I'm really happy, although also somewhat unhappy given the situation, to welcome you at the Peace Unconditional Conference, which comes at a time when peace has become increasingly scarce and discouraged. Indeed, a discredited value that instead of providing a common ground for discussion appears to reinforce polarization, political and ideological distances. Uh, over the next couple of days, we'll have the opportunity to hear a number of papers from researchers, artists, curators, journalists. They all deal with the question of peace, yet employ different perspectives, speak from different professional backgrounds and contexts. And departing from this, the main ambition is as a, uh, to open up the space for discussing peace as a value, as a practice in historical perspective and in present day contexts. I think it's crucial to speak about this today, all the more so than ever before. Or, well, there comes cyclical times when the topic becomes uh, relevant. Uh, and not just because it seems to, the, the debate about peace seems to be off uh, the agenda, but also because it is a challenge. It is a challenge to talk about peace in a time when in different parts of the world, not so far from us, uh, the wars are going on. Now, this initial idea for uh, the conference was born at a project meeting earlier this year uh, during a heated debate uh, about the situation in Ukraine. And it made me ask, why is it so difficult to talk about peace today? Or uh, is it at all possible to talk about peace during wartime, and uh, if it is, how then can we talk about peace? Uh, and how we can also talk about the conditions uh, and the reasons for war in wartime. And uh, knowing it is difficult to do so, it is also clear that as much as wars are in the making well before they erupt, and having said erupt, uh, is it not that wars not just erupt, but are rather a consequence of decisions of, made by real people. Uh, so it is important to think about and discuss what peace might look also once the war is over. Now this reminds me of a work of a French uh, author, novelist and essayist, Romain Rolland, who was actively expressing critical opposition to the First World War and also won Nobel Peace Prize in 1915. Uh, he was, uh, actually, he was rejecting pacifism and was taking a rather more pragmatic stance, realizing that it's difficult, if not impossible, in the circumstances of a raging war to oppose the war. And he opposed also uh, the idea of conscientious objections in that context. Uh, still, he was very, very much critical about uh, the situation during the, the, the First World War. And in an article titled, Our Neighbor, the Enemy, from 1915, he says so. I know that each of their efforts, like mine, that each of the words of love rouses and turns against the, the, the hostility of two hostile camps. The combatants, pitted against each other, agree in hating those who refuse to hate. Europe is like a besieged town. Fever is raging. Whoever will not rave, like the rest, is suspect. And in these hurried times when justice cannot wait to study evidence, every suspect is a traitor. Whoever insists in the midst of the war on defending peace among men knows that he risks his own peace, his reputation, his friends for his belief. But uh, of what value is a belief for which no risks are taken? Uh, and he continues, those, those passionate natures that 
are intoxicated by fighting or are voluntarily blinded by the necessities of action are not troubled by these questions. For them, the enemy is a single mass. Nothing else exists for them but this, for they have to break it in their function and duty. But if minorities do not exist for such men, they do exist for us, who, since we are not fighting, have the liberty and the duty to see every aspect of the case. We who form part of eternal minority, the minority which has been, is and always will be eternally oppressed. Uh, his observations from over a century ago seem eerily relevant today. Uh, we seem to have been caught in a collective intoxication where the field of discussion and debate is shrinking. Uh, we've been imprisoned into a binary logic of eternal good versus utter evil, which clearly does not help resolving conflicts, but rather extrapolates them into the future. For it is such logic that posits one actor in war as entirely spotless and the other one always already impure. Out of this, both parties draw legitimacy for their actions, which tend to produce even more hatred, violence, crimes for the generations to come. In that context, uh, which clearly demands a lot of effort, it's worth remembering uh, Roland's position again, because he advocated that uh, for during war, there should be uh, a striving for humanizing war, primarily phasing out hatred, but he was also thinking about uh, what comes after, so preparing the ground for the post-war world. And this perspective comes across as a pragmatic realization that there are limits not only to individual but also collective action against the uh, above-mentioned intoxication. And this realization was also part later on after the Second World War and the attempts to define and construct the infrastructure of the future. And the slogan of that was never again. The phrase never again rose out of the horrors and the debris of the World War and the Holocaust. The phrase inflected much of post uh, Second World War history and it neatly fitted into the drive for material and symbolic reconstruction of what Keith Flau calls the savage continent. It was a promise of hope. Uh, it rested, never again rested on the dedication of post war societies that, in order not to repeat the horrendous events, it was critical to set in place a system of transnational governments, international laws, and treaties, and not to slide into uh, lawlessness, lawlessness and chaos. The task was invented, in, invested in, also into the United Nations as, as an approximation of world authority, while at the same time the international law was and is biased, and as much, or, and as such, also means a prolongation of the legacy of Western imperial subordination uh, and extraction. And along with the idea also that emerged in that time more forcefully of peaceful coexistence, which was promoted by uh, the non-aligned movement, anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism were ingrained into that, uh, also uh, acting as a counterweight to the bipolarity of the East-West and socialist capitalist uh, political and economic systems. And ever since the collapse of state socialism and the ensuing ever more radical neoliberalization and mono ideation uh, of the world, however, it seems that never again lost its uh, mnemonic and post-traumatic uh, moral future-oriented obligatory potential against the increasingly empty political performativity. Now, uh, to turn this perspective around a bit and pose some further questions on the conditions of peace, it's also critical to approach the more structural, economic, and political conditions of uh, the ongoing uh, neoliberalization. In that respect, German sociologist Hartmut Rosa spoke, speaks about the current condition as the world as a point of aggression. And he says, everything that appears to us must be known, mastered, conquered, made useful, expressed abstractly. This sounds banal at first, but it is not. Lurking behind this idea is a creeping re reorganization of our relationship to the world that stretches far back historically, culturally, economically, and institutionally. But in the 21st century, it has become newly radicalized, not least as a result of the technological possibilities unleashed by digitalization and by the demands for optimization and growth produced by financial market capitalism and unbridled competition. 
In the neoliberal takeover of the mind and the body of land and time, this means that everything and everyone is not just a product, clearly, but also a potential enemy and adversary. Taken to the extreme, this means that in order to contain this threat, an adversary, in order to be subdued, must be destroyed. Regardless of, rather, of the, uh, of the treaties and laws, victory and domination are posited as the utmost value instead of respectful cooperation. Um, and in such a world, there is, unfortunately, I would say, no use for peace, for never again or for peaceful coexistence. There's no room for thought. There's no time to stop and ponder. No need to reflect and debate. In such a world, however, there's plenty of room for ding for both and for the cynical imposition of mythical relations between us and them. The good is us, usually, and the evil is the other. However, never again uh, must be absolute, or it will always be now. Uh, I hope uh, the discussions over the next days were, will also contribute to this end. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you will find something useful from uh, the, the, the presentations that follow and that we will at least marginally contribute to bringing debate about not just peace, but also about our common future into focus again. Thank you so much. Good morning also from my side. My name is Tanya Petrovic, and I'm here to wel welcome you in my own name, of course, but also uh, on behalf of Professor Otto Luther, director of the, of the Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts, who unfortunately fell ill and could not join us today, although he really wanted to. For our guests coming, from the outside, I will say a few words about the, institutions, the institution that hosts this event. It's a research center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts, which is one of the largest research institutions in this country, uh, comprised of 18 research institutes, ma mainly dealing with humanities and social sciences, but also with, uh, with natural sciences. The Institute of Culture and Memory Studies, uh, your real host here, uh, is the youngest among these institutes, and um, our main, I'm coming from that institute also, Martin and many of the colleagues uh, who will uh, present in this conference in these two days. Uh, our main emphasis in, in, is uh, the, uh, of our research is on the questions concerning the historization of watershed events and processes that took place in the previous century, both in Slovenia, but also in the wider uh, region of Southeast or Central Europe. We try to focus on multi-layered phenomenon of, of, mem of memory, its social role and political relevance, and its relation with collective imaginations of the future. It is these collective imaginations of the future, as, uh, uh, which is one our, of our main concerns, uh, which closely connects our work generally with the topic of this, uh, this conference. The conference, as Mar Martin already said, take, takes place in a rather uh, specific moment, in the moment in which we all somehow share a sense of urgency, both in moral and also intellectual terms. An urgency to understand in, which, in what kind of political, historical, social moment we found ourselves today, here, and now. Last night, Otto wrote me uh, that he cannot come, ask me to greet you, and told me also that his cold somehow concentrating on his throat, he, so he has a difficulty speaking. But I think this difficulty speaking uh, is something we all also share here today, um, not only because there are so many viruses in the fall, uh, which usually come every fall attacking us, but also, um, also in terms of um, like 
we are facing a situation in which uh, discourse, possibility of speaking becomes very foreclosed and confined to very binary, binary categories. So I think one of the really uh, urgent things we want to um, address with, with this conference is understanding this moment, the moment in which uh, um, somehow speaking about vulnerability is all around us, but our, uh, like our uh, proneness for empathy, seeing the other, understanding another is somehow very radically reduced. We speak a lot about voice, having voice, having right to speak, uh, but at the same time, we are facing this impossibility to say things, to discuss things openly, to allow for alternatives. We speak a lot about self-care and care in general, but again, recognizing the other in moral, universal terms becomes another challenge in this political moment. We speak so much about decoloniality and the necessity to de decolonize everything, but at the same time, this discourse is pretty much, discourse we have at our disposal is, is pretty much reduced, boiled down to rather kind of, you know, cultural categories, categories uh, uh, over which and cultural ideas of European values and European civilization somehow dominate once again. So this is basically um, also the moment in which, curiously speaking about peace, becomes one of the most contented ideas we can imagine. Peace became a, a polarizing category much more than war, much more than violence, much more than anything else. Uh, and uh, that bring us, brings us to another important issue we wanted to tackle with this conference, and that's the urge and urgency to also recuperate, recuperate something that famously Kozelek was calling the future's past, to understand times in which future was an imaginable, an imaginable category, because our own present somehow does not allow much space for imagining the future to any of us. So this recuperating the future past is basically the very important labor, and I'm sure many of us in the next two days will, will refer also to this second aspect I find important for this conference. Uh, I'm very aware that this urgency we share here today uh, may, may sound a bit, uh, again, centric, not only Eurocentric, but centric also in in temporal terms, I'm sure the, the sense of urgency is not um, exclusive to our time and to our space, but this is the time and the space from which we have to fight for ability to speak. And I'm very grateful that you decided to join us in this effort. Thank you so much.